Thank you for joining the Minecraft Education Edition webinar series. This session was recorded on June 15, 2020. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, and I want to remind everybody that all of the sessions this week will be recorded and all of the resources will be shared out through email. So uh, just kind of sit back, relax, take it in, um, and we'll have a you know a great week of learning together. So I'm gonna I'm gonna share a little bit about myself, but I also want to let you know that later in today's session, we are very lucky to have Maria uh, joining us. Maria is a global Minecraft mentor, and she'll have a chance to introduce herself and tell us some of the amazing things she's doing in her classroom with Minecraft. Um, after I speak a little bit, just to set the context of you know what Minecraft in education is all about. Um, my name is Steve Isaacs. I teach game design and development at William Annan Middle School and Ridge High School in Basking Ridge, New Jersey. And I've now been using Minecraft for about seven years in the classroom, uh, but but it's important for me to share my the start of my story with Minecraft because like many people, um, I wasn't so familiar with Minecraft. I didn't play it myself, um, my students, were continually talking about this game and you know I had even tried it a few times but but quite honestly um, it was the fact that it meant so much to my students that made me feel I really had to bring this game into the learning environment. Um, you know I did understand that there would be ways to integrate it but I also was well aware that I was not going to be the expert here and I had to um, change my you know way of thinking quite a bit and actually, uh, you know, learn to, you know, put a lot of the the learning in the hands of my students, um, allow students to be the experts and allow them to teach me quite a bit and embrace the power of co-learning. Um, so it was quite a shift for me, but it was transformational. And I bring that up because I think many um, teachers that think about bringing Minecraft into the classroom start with that thought that either I don't play games or I don't know how to play or I don't know how to teach them to play and and you know there's certain things that I learned we had to let go of <laughs> and it was a really wonderful uh, pivotal moment in my career quite honestly. So we're going to talk about um, a number of things today. Uh, we're going to just break it down a little bit. What is Minecraft? Uh, the important question, uh, which I believe is very important, is the why. You know, why do we see value? Why do we want to use this tool in education? Um, and then finally, we'll talk a little bit about how to play Minecraft, just to give you that context. Um, it's a, you know, it's not a hands-on session by any means, but I do hope that people will, um, after the session, take it to that next level and start to uh, dabble and play. So um, Allison mentioned uh, that Minecraft is the best selling game of all time, uh, recently taking over um, Tetris, which was <laughs> for a long time the best selling game. Um, it, it, it's amazing because um, it's available on just about every platform you can imagine. It's available on your phone. It's available on the PlayStation. It's available on the Xbox, the Nintendo Switch, the iPad, PC, Mac. Um, so it's really, you know, um, accessible. And so many kids have, you know, entered into the world of Minecraft in one way or another. Um, at its core, it, it's what we consider a sandbox game, which makes me also really want to reframe the thinking a little bit and think of it as a tool in education. Um, you know, there are several different ways you can play. There's a mode called creative mode where you have access to all of the resources and you can build whatever you'd like and incorporate any of the functions within the game. Um, and then there's a survival mode, which is more of a game where you're having to gather resources and craft different items, which is where it got that name Minecraft and actually, you know, start essentially from nothing and you know go through this process to ultimately defeat the ender dragon but that's really more on the survival side of the game um, and in education i'd say more often than not it's used in creative mode um, 
you know, and, and kids are, are given these opportunities to demonstrate their creativity in pretty amazing ways. Uh, so it's really like a building environment. A lot of people think of it uh, like virtual Lego. Uh, you basically have tons of different blocks that you can choose to build with. And while, <laughs> while it's very blocky, um, you know, it's amazing the creations people can make in this game. And you'll have to, if you haven't seen some of the amazing things already, I mean, people have recreated Hogwarts in Minecraft. Um, Allison was mentioning how so many people have recreated like to scale even their schools and things like that. Um, one of the other things that's really important about the game itself, which kind of expands beyond that, um, that virtual Lego idea is that you can do all sorts of uh, amazing things with automation or engineering. So there are me mechanics in Minecraft that allow you to use something called redstone, which is essentially electric circuitry in the game. There's um, these command blocks or commands and coding that can be go into the game. So it's like you go beyond just these building blocks to being able to do very sophisticated things at the right when you're at that level, which uh, also brings me to one of my favorite things about this game is we, we like to say that there's Minecraft has an incredibly low floor and an incredibly high ceiling for learning, meaning that um, you've probably seen four or five, six year olds build some pretty great things in Minecraft. Um, I teach middle and high school kids, and when they start getting more advanced with the automation and the engineering type things, I see how, you know, while a kindergartner might be playing it and be, having it be a very meaningful, purposeful experience, my high school students are doing amazing things with this game that really, um, you know, like I say, when in, ter in terms of skills like engineering, I mean, they're really, really pushing the limits. Um, so, you know, the, the neat thing about that too is the scaffolding or the scaffolded learning. And much of that happens in a very natural way because kids start doing something and they see something somebody else could do. So they go ahead and they push themselves further than they would generally in school because they want to do, you know, they want to learn how to do something. It's uh, absolutely amazing to watch that in the classroom. So, you know, why Minecraft in education? Uh, so I'm a huge fan myself of game based learning and but but I will say this. Um, so game based learning generally speaks to the idea of using, you know, games to um, to enhance the learning of something, right? So oftentimes that means, let's just say, you know, as an example, playing the game of civilization in the classroom to learn about ancient civilizations. Um, that's great for like a history class and maybe some other classes. What's, what, what Minecraft and sandbox games like it did was they completely changed the, the, um, the narrative around what it means to use games in the classroom because now games like Minecraft are being used as an absolute content creation tool. So kids are creating um, amazing things. Uh, this picture I love, it's, um, during this COVID time, uh, it's been amazing to see how people have been incorporating Minecraft um, and the number of build challenges and things that have come out to give students uh, meaningful you know, activities during this time at home. Um, one of the ones I worked with, um, Eric Leitner and uh, Kathy Chow Isaacs, and uh, that's my wife, and Nasef, um, and we put together a set of, of COVID build challenges in Minecraft. Um, so some of them included, you know, like this one, the Museum of COVID. Um, there was a one of the uh, activities was called Inform the Public, and kids had to do research around COVID-19, and you know they were we were trying to make sure they understood about checking multiple sources and and all of that, and they built um, a museum or library to teach others about, you know, about um, the pandemic. And uh, one of the others, which this student actually built into this one, was to build a model of the COVID virus. So, you know, you could see where we were bringing in um, research skills as well as science skills and all sorts of neat things. 
um, you know, while allowing kids to be creative and, and solve problems. Um, so it's also, you know, it's being used in every content area you could imagine. Um, I've been blown away by other educators and the way they've used Minecraft. Um, there are a couple of um, educators, uh, Ben Spieldetter um, and, and, uh, and Simon Badley, uh, have created a lot of language arts activities like around um, stories like uh, Romeo and Juliet uh, and the Crucible and such. So we're taking it to high school, you know, language arts there. And um, there are many, many programs that get into humanities and history and, and math. And again, a big part of it is when we have the kids being the creators of the content and then you know, becoming the expert in that subject matter and sharing that, which is pretty impressive. Definitely a lot of tech and STEM integration, like I mentioned with the automation and engineering. Uh, it's a wonderful tool for narrative and storytelling. And in fact, I'll get to it shortly and talk about some of the uh, specific features in Education Edition that really support that. But we really um, provide an opportunity for kids to be storytellers and educators to be storytellers and build content that has, you know, actual content, um, you know, to go with it thanks to these tools. Uh, it's widely used for digital citizenship uh, in a very authentic way. Uh, and most classes or most teachers I've spoken with come to a point where as a class or as a community, they come up with norms and a code of conduct for playing the game in order to um, you know, work together, but it's really teaching digital citizenship in, in context. And SEL, there's even um, you know, a number of uh, activities you can find in the community space for uh, social emotional learning in Minecraft. Uh, and one of the ones that's so important to me is that we're leveraging student expertise. And this goes back to what I was saying about even my own experience and my students is kids, it's very empowering and very powerful for kids to come in and be able to use a tool that they're comfortable with, you know, and as educators, our role, at least in my opinion, is to um, facilitate the learning and guide the process. And with, you know, Minecraft uh, in the classroom, we can do that, yet we're not actually spending a lot of the time teaching the tools. So it's not it's rare that we're spending a lot of time in class teaching kids how to play Minecraft. Rather, we're crafting experiences that they can then, you know, take their expertise and really utilize it in a way that is very relevant to them. Um, I love this quote as well. It's, uh, we're not trying to turn your students into gamers. We're trying to turn your gamers into students. Um, that really sums up a lot of real neat ideas around game-based learning. Um, this is what's relevant and meaningful to kids at home. So this provides us with an opportunity to honor what's important to them and, you know, and nurture that uh, passion that they already have. And uh, as I was saying too, there are a number of Minecraft of features in Education Edition that are um, that are specific to Minecraft Education Edition. So um, this just shows a few pictures, but I'll explain what, what these different things are. So Minecraft has a camera and a portfolio, which is a really powerful assessment tool. So in the game, um, you could have students go around and use the camera tool to take pictures of learning artifacts in the game, and then their portfolio collects these pictures and they can then pull that out of the game and give it to you as demonstration of their learning, uh, which is really helpful um, because, in other words, if you give kids an assignment or a task in Minecraft and want them to then come back and report what they did and what they learned, it's really um, great when they can go in and actually document their experience right in the game and then bring that out to hand to you. Um, it also helps the fact that then it, an educator doesn't have to necessarily go in and re-experience their entire world in Minecraft when they bring the learning out of it. Um, there's, I love the picture uh, on the upper right, and I'll just explain what that is. Um, there's something called a structure block in Minecraft, which allows you to pull um, 3D objects out of Minecraft and through augmented reality, place them in the real world. Um, 
So this is a this is a car that um, oh, and I'm just drawing a blank. She's a, a good friend that uh, created uh, this this project. Um, but she and her students, you know, worked with this tool, and then they actually brought their car, which is not really there on the uh, <laughs> on the driveway, into the real world um, with augmented reality and placed it in there. Um, then, you know, in the lower left, I'm showing a picture uh, and on the middle of the bottom as well of something called NPCs or non-player characters. Um, so Jerry there on the left is that's from the student project I was talking about with the COVID museum. Um, they the student used NPCs or non-player characters to bring um, to, to actually narrate the story. Um, if you see in the bottom middle also, there are these things called boards. They're those big blackboards that you see in the background. Now, below the blackboard is a sign. Now, those little wood signs are in the regular game of Minecraft, but the education team brought things like that big board, um, something called a slate and poster to provide other opportunities for students to put more writing into their projects. Um, and that's one of the things the NPCs can do. Um, the NPCs can also um, take people out of the game and to a website. So if if the educator or the student wants to help you find more information on a topic, they can actually have it set up that after talking to this NPC, you click a button and it opens the web browser and brings you to an outside website. So, so many great tools um, that the education team created in order to better support educators um, in terms of, you know, narrative, storytelling, assessment, and such um, within the game. So that's really important and interesting to know um, in terms of the education team. Also, the, um, I should say, the chemistry um, uh, add-on that Allison was talking about, that um, was created for the education edition, and that does allow you to learn chemistry with blocks that were not in the original game, but were brought into the education edition, and a whole lot of them to help you teach chemistry. Um, and then <laughs> Code Builder, which uh, you'll hear about later in the week, um, is allows you to do block-based and even JavaScript and Python coding right in Minecraft. So they've done an amazing job of creating um, you know, resources and, and tools to enhance the learning with Minecraft. Uh, let's see here. Um, then, you know, so when you start exploring Education Edition, right within the game, and this is a new edition as well, um, they added what's called the library. So in the library, which again, when you're in the game, so you log into Minecraft and the library is immediately available to you, there are lessons um, that can be filtered by subject area. Um, so right off, right out of the gate, there are a bunch of lessons that are built right into the game and they have most of them have like a world that you can um, that you can create right from the lesson plan. So like if there's a certain history lesson that actually has a world that supports it, you can download that world and your kids start in the world that is the starter world for that activity. Um, the lessons are great. Uh, they provide you know educators with a, a wealth of potential class uh, subjects and and uh, content lessons to draw from, and you can also, of course, modify them as you see fit. Um, the education team brought in a number of monthly build challenges. Uh, the build challenges, I think, are really becoming a very interesting way to bring sort of, you know, the global perspective into uh, Minecraft because these are challenges that people all around the world can participate in. And then there's the biomes and worlds, which is means you know, biomes, there are different biome starter worlds that you can go in. So if you want to start in um, in the desert, you can have kids start in a desert and that's the world they would start with. And then there's also the section in the library on how to play. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So, you know, I had mentioned the lessons, they're filtered by content area. And I mean, 
some of the some of the starter worlds for these lessons are just so wonderful and they're often created by by you know educators um a lot of the lessons were contributed by people in the community as well as um global mentors and and, and such um i wanted to pro provide these resources which uh like i said these will be included in the email but uh but if you want to snap a picture or take a screenshot uh, you'll have them available for you. But the Minecraft Education Edition website is a tremendous resource um, that brings you to an, <laughs> another whole set of lesson plans. Um, so, so there are a number of them that have made it right into the game, and then there are many more that are available through education.minecraft.net. There is um, a way to you know, connect with other educators. Um, there's a forum there. Uh, you could find out you know who the mentors are. Uh, the mentor program is made up of hundreds of, of, of Minecraft using educators around the world that are available to connect with to get support and essentially help you get started. Uh, the actual Minecraft Education Edition download link is right there. Um, and currently, I believe for a little while more, it's uh, free with your, you know, um, because of the, the um, distance learning, but uh, you can always, if you have an Office 365 account, download and educator accounts, get at least 25, get 25 trial logins before you uh, purchase a license. Um, and many schools right now have district wide licenses because of their licensing with Microsoft uh, Office products. Uh, the My Minecraft Journey course, that allows you to learn about Minecraft through um, the Microsoft Education community, and you can earn a few badges there and really learn about the game and actually apply what you're learning. Uh, the official Minecraft Education Edition podcast uh, was launched recently. There are four episodes currently. Um, I happen to be on the one that was just released, I think, last week. Uh, but Mike Washburn uh, is doing a phenomenal job with that podcast and has had uh, guests like, I believe, Becky Keene, Ben Kelly, uh, Trish Cloud so far, uh, Ben Spieldenner, and uh, Chris Burkott, I think his name is, but um, really great stuff. And it, it's a really, it's a very engaging conversation um, to, to listen to. And then uh, there's a wakelet uh, there that uh, I've been curating um, and continue to, so there are a number of resources there as well. So I did say earlier, we talked a little bit about how to play. Um, now, this is interesting because I have a picture there of how to play when I teach people how to play with the keyboard and mouse. Um, with, with On the computer, uh, you use the W, A, S, and D keys as if they were the arrow keys, but for anybody who plays games, those are the directional movement keys when you play games. Um, the mouse serves as like your eyes and your hands. So when you move the mouse, you can look around the world. You can um, left click to break blocks, right click to place blocks. And those numbers on the bottom represent your current like hot bar or tool belt of items from your inventory that are easily accessed by using the number corresponding. Um, but nowadays, like I'd said, the uh, Minecraft is available on the iPad. So the iPad uses touch controls, which are, of course, a little bit different. Um, it's somewhat of a virtual keyboard, but it's also, um, you know, takes a little different getting used to in terms of just the 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 clicking blocks that part. But but it uh, <laughs> funny thing is, again, it might be more challenging for us at times, but the kids grew up on that. So it's uh, they play like it's nothing. And uh, if you're playing on like the Xbox or the PlayStation, you're often playing with a game controller. I personally have a number of game controllers in my classroom because I'm, you know, some kids would prefer that and it's fine with me. It doesn't, you know, um, but I have found it interesting that over the last couple of years, I've spent a lot more time teaching kids how to use the keyboard and mouse because the, the newer wave of kids playing are coming definitely from playing on a console or their iPad or iPhone. All right, so <clears throat> another couple of like little strategies for getting started. Um, I did show you when we were in the library that one of the buttons was for how to play. 
So right within there, there are a number of tutorials that you can go into. And what happens when you go into one of those worlds, it, you create the world, it puts you in that world, and you immediately start following directions to learn how to play. You'll be greeted by an NPC, you'll learn to right click the NPC to interact with it, and you'll move forward and, and it'll have you using the keyboard and mouse and all of that. Um, there's another tutorial strictly um, dedicated to just movement and moving around. Just getting the hang of that is a really great thing. And then we could go on to things like Code Builder, where you could learn a whole lot about coding in Minecraft. And um, and I got to tell you, there's so many resources both within the education community and outside of that. Um, one of the things I love about Minecraft is that it really did not come with an instruction manual, but rather all of the content that um, that is out there to teach about the game is is created and generated by users. So it's really neat to think that, um, you know, that's how kids learn. Kids learn by going to YouTube and figuring something out. They learn by going to the wiki. So that also shaped my approach to teaching and learning quite a bit when I started thinking like, why aren't we having kids learn in the way that makes the most sense to them? And quite honestly, when I go to learn these days, I'm looking to those kinds of resources as well. Um, there is also a tutorial on the chemistry add-on. And um, yeah, so so that's the start. Uh, the education edition training in the Microsoft Educator community, like I had mentioned before, that takes you on your Minecraft journey, as well as some other learning opportunities is really valuable. Um, one of my favorites is to find a kid to mentor you maybe your own kid, maybe create a lunch bunch at school. Um, I have yet to meet a kid that hasn't been excited about the opportunity to teach their teacher how to play Minecraft. Uh, again, it, it empowers them in a way that they are ex very excited about. Um, and like I said, learn like the kids. Uh, go online and figure stuff out. Um, I think it'll be an amazing experience for you to say, I don't know how to do this. Let me find out how to do it um, and play. I mean, again, you don't have to be the expert by any means, but uh, the game, I, 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 I've been doing a lot of training with educators, and I will say that once they get started, they um, truly start to uh, enjoy the, uh, you know, enjoy playing. So uh, by all means, join in and do that. Um, so let's see. So let's see here if. Uh, I will ask Jen because we are up to, I know it originally, I don't know if Maria had joined us, but hopefully she has by now. Hello everybody, my name is Maria Jose. I'm an English teacher from Argentina and I wanted to share about my work using Minecraft in the classroom. I teach English and I use it in my collaborative projects, mainly in developing uh, critical thinking with students. We work with sustainable goals and they thought about different important subjects that could be addressed to, uh, to causes and solutions for their daily life. Uh, one of my projects that is mo mostly known about is about poverty. In that case, the students were collaboratively in teams and what they did was to think about possible causes for hunger and then um, they all together tried to put all this work in a world, in Minecraft, working collaboratively together uh, as we are learning a second language. What they did was also to work with vocabulary. Uh, so, uh, seeing all the courses, they uh, wrote the words in English, that is the second language they are learning. Also, they thought about different solutions uh, working on this. They uh, researched for different terms that they didn't know in the language they were learning, and they were all together collaboratively uh, on uh, the project with other parts of the world, designing solutions and showing their work. It was really motivating and engaging for them since 
they could uh, learn not only vocabulary, but also about sustainable goals and what they could do as agents of this world. Uh, another project we worked on was um, about peace. In that one, I just done a lesson, maybe you know the community that we have in Minecraft education, where you can collaborate like, with different teachers and work together. Uh, in that case, uh, students work for peace, designing different flags of their country, and they, they share their experiences. In my case, that we are working with a second language that they are learning, that is English, uh, students show this work to other parts of the world, can, uh, country, that uh, they are not theirs and they communicate with teachers and classrooms of different parts of the world and uh, they show their work, uh, pictures, presentations in Minecraft and also they give explanations and help them also to communicate in the language and to learn new terms. So uh, Minecraft is not only game, it's just more than that, that you can also use as a trigger for communication to develop critical thinking and also for learning a new language. We'd like to thank Maria for pre-recording her presentation and sharing it during our webinar. We'll now turn the time back to Steve to tell us about his journey to becoming a Minecraft Education Edition Global Mentor. Steve, take it away. I would be happy to, thanks. So, gosh, so, so, um, the mentor program has been in existence probably about five years now. And I, I would say five or six years ago, I was contacted by the Education Edition team and they had this idea um, to start a mentor program and wanted to pilot it. And they piloted it with five um, educators that were using Minecraft extensively. You know, so originally um, it was Danelle Batty, myself, Stephen Reed, and there were a couple of others. Um, maybe it was Katya Beauregard, and that's who that picture was earlier. But there were five of us, and we were um, asked to kind of, you know, see how this program would work. So it was really exciting because when it started, um, what they did was they set it up in such a way that people who were interested in getting started with Minecraft could contact us through the Microsoft Educator site and set up essentially a Skype call and we would sort of talk to them or their class about using Minecraft in schools. And at that time, because there was a, a, only a few of us, we were working with people around the world. So for me, that was a, a wonderful experience. I, I spent time with a number of um, educators, at least two or three classes that happened to be in India. And it was so interesting at the time because Minecraft was already huge in, you know, in, in the United States and probably a lot of the world. But Minecraft was really not, um, even the kids, like, like it was not big in India at the time. So it was really neat to have this opportunity to show these kids who were so excited about learning the possibilities of Minecraft and then to stay in touch with some of these classes moving forward and um, hear back from them, whether it be from an actual student or the teacher sharing, you know, their progress and such. So that was really special to me. Um, and then I continued to stay active in that mentor community, I think now going on five years. And, and the community has grown quite large, um, which is, you know, makes it definitely easier to find a mentor that you can speak with about getting started with Minecraft. Um, I'll also say that in general, the community of educators around using Minecraft or, you know, and game-based learning happen to be among the most generous and wonderful people I've come in contact with. So um, part of it for me is that that was something of great interest to me. Um, so when I did start thinking way back then, I that was when I first started using Twitter and I would reach out to people like I remember reaching out to um, Joel Levin, who was one of the, the um, you know, primary users of Minecraft in education at the time. And and 
you know, to hear back and, and, and get have somebody like that willing to help me get started was really powerful. Um, so that made me realize real quick that while in my school at the time, there weren't many people using Minecraft or games, it was really important for me to find others out there that I could, you know, collaborate with um, and learn with and from. Um, you know, so I'm fortunate and, and um, grateful that over time, not only have I benefited so greatly from, um, you know, the people in the community, but I feel like I've been able to give back to the community as well. So the mentor program is, is pretty great. If you, um, if you do go through the My Minecraft Journey activities, um, that's a good starting point for to eventually, you know, get into uh, becoming a mentor in Minecraft. Um, and if I could, a uh, couple of little things that, that I just would love to to share um, that are that just are fresh in my mind right now about some of the work that other people, other mentors and things are doing. Like um, Ben Kelly is one of the mentors um, who happens to be up in Canada. And he, you know, he, we were talking even this morning actually about um, projects in Minecraft and he, uh, one of the projects I participated in that he started, which was phenomenal, was uh, the, it was called the uh, SDG Shuffle um, about the sustainable development goals. And what he had done with that project, which was just absolutely amazing, was he found, I think it was 20 classrooms around the world that were interested in participating and each classroom would get this world that he created the base world for and he would then you know you would have your students solve sdg issues in minecraft and then after two weeks you would pass the world back to um to where it was being stored and then the next teacher would take the same world and add to it so in the 40 weeks that this took place 20 different classes of students contributed to this and became this this world where people kids from around the world contributed to global um, issues together which is awesome and currently he just started something which is um, happening for the next two weeks for any of you that might be in Canada um, is they're using uh, Minecraft to tell um, stories you know of Canada like so some you know um, you know, popular whatever stories that of things that took place in Canada. So they're sort of creating a narrative around the history through storytelling, um, which is is happening right now. Um, and there's so many other amazing uh, <laughs> projects that I could speak of. Um, if uh, you know uh, Stephen Reed, if you're familiar with his work, he uh, created a, a refugee crisis. Uh, experience in Minecraft and with that you you know develop empathy through experiencing what it would be like to be a Syrian refugee um, but through the game um, so there are people like tackling big issues um, coming up with creative ideas for for what their students can do and it's been you know it, it, I couldn't be um, happier you know like the thing I'm so excited about is is the community of these other just in my mind amazing educators that I've you know become very friendly with and and seen the wonderful work they've been doing. Thanks Steve it looks like we're still having issues um, with getting Marie to join live she's been on the chat answering questions and we appreciate her for that so good um, thank you for that. Uh, sure. Do you want to share anything else that you've been using with Minecraft in your classroom or some of the cool, amazing things your students have been doing with it? Yeah, absolutely. So um, <laughs> one of my favorite projects that my students do, and this is going to also be be a collaborative uh, or a big project coming up soon for, for people beyond my class, is um, I have students uh, create Rube Goldberg machines in Minecraft. And um, that uh, project has been really neat because that really focuses on that automation and engineering and the lesson plan and this happens a lot with me with my students is that I might write a lesson plan that while I teach game design the lesson is not just for kids in in you know in game design by any means so the Rube Goldberg lesson 
um, teaches kids about simple machines and has them emulate them in, in Minecraft. And we've been talking recently with, um, with the Rube Goldberg Foundation and they are excited to be working um, with us to create a global challenge for, I believe it'll start in August. It'll run through maybe most of next year or definitely the fall. It, it might extend further um, where they're gonna be um, hosting a, a, a global challenge for creating a Rube Goldberg machine in Minecraft with a purpose, um, which I don't think I could reveal yet because um, they have to be, they'll want to announce all of the the, uh, the secret wonderful details and things, but that's something we're excited about. Um, one of the other projects I do with all of my students or all of my seventh graders in particular is something called Fairy Tales Reimagined. And that's one of the lessons you can find in the um, education site. And the Fairy Tales Reimagined lesson, what I, I have kids take a fairy tale, folk tale or fable, um, and rewrite it kind of like some people, I, I didn't even know the term until people started telling me it was like it, but fractured fable tale or fractured fairy tales, I guess is the other other way that the idea has been used. Um, so they rewrite it and sort of Minecraftize it and also build some challenges into it. So it becomes a, an activity in digital storytelling and game design. So every seventh grader in our school um, does that project as their six week computer cycle project. Um, and that's been really successful. And we've had great, you know, versions of Hansel and Gretel and Cinderella and Rapunzel and all sorts of neat things like that. Um, and then again, since I teach game design, my kids create full mini games and, and games, you know, in Minecraft where they follow through in the whole design process where they write their design document, come up with the sketches for their levels, write the storyline and build in all the other elements of their game and then start to build it, have their peers test it and ultimately publish um, a game, you know, when they've finished it. So, um, it, you know, I've just seen kids have an amazing time. Um, you know, I, and, and they're so motivated, even in this time of um, distance learning. And I, I know a lot of other people would share this is that the, you know, schools that either decided to adopt Minecraft Education Edition during the distance learning or had already adopted it and were using it, you know, have, you know, had great success in, in you know, having kids stay, um, you know, engaged in meaningful activities during this time. And like I had mentioned earlier too, we had started developing these um, build challenges, you know, like, like how Ben Kelly had as well. And we've been making them global. So we've gone from this time where maybe you have an assignment meant for your students and now all of a sudden it's available to the world. So our COVID build challenges involved six build challenges that kids around the world participated in. We've got we got hundreds of entries. Um, what they did, which was neat, is they created they completed the task. So one of them was build your your um, quarantine dream home. Um, one was build a model of the COVID virus. One was the inform the public that I talked to you about um, where kids created a museum or a library uh, and um, and told us, you know, a timeline of, of, the, of COVID um, through that. One was um, an escape room experience where they had to <laughs> um, break into, instead of escaping out of, they had to break into the bathroom to wash their hands, which is quite important during these times. And we also had a Rube Goldberg um, activity there where the goal was also to um, solve a COVID related problem, you know, like whether it be washing your hands or whatnot, but through a Rube Goldberg machine. Um, and we also had um, students design a hospital of the future for that. So there were six build challenges. What they did was they created it and then they filmed a short video to show their their project and those were posted to Flipgrid. So all of the entries were in Flipgrid. And after the success of that, we worked with the NHL who, um, and specifically the Anaheim Ducks and a few other teams who were trying to also keep their fans engaged at a time when they didn't have their sports happening live. So we did a number of build challenges there. One was um, 
creating a a logo like a new version of a logo for their favorite team one was creating a jersey and the other was um which was awesome was creating a um an arena a, a hockey arena of the future and we got entries like one took place on a cruise ship and traveled rather than just having one home base um others had uh, were you know were were suspended in the air um but what was really cool is a number of the entries also made a fully playable hockey mini game within that um so there was that coming up very soon we have something called the minecraft masters that we're doing in conjunction with um NACEF again NACEF is the North American Scholastic Esports Federation and um, Eric Leitner from Broward County, um, my wife Kathy and the NACEF team um, were creating this set of challenges um, where where participants will have one challenge to as their entry and then the four best teams will compete in what we're calling the Minecraft Masters where there will be three live events um, that they'll have to compete in for points, um, you know, and, and that's going to get into a lot of the different skills like coding and engineering and uh, commands and command blocks and redstone and all these great things. So that's going to be something that is going to be open to everyone, um, you know, in or outside of school. And uh, so keep a lookout for that as well. And uh, I'm also happy to answer any questions, Jen, if there were any that um, that I could yeah. address. Or just um, looking through our conversations window of people who are posting um, some things here. Um, so one question was, a sense uh, Minecraft Education Edition does not support voice communication. What platform would you recommend to effectively facilitate slash teach students with Minecraft Education Edition in a remote learning environment? Oh, that's great. So you're saying doesn't support voice meaning that we can't talk within the game so if you're using it for remote learning how would you also communicate yeah, um, I believe, yes yeah so that's interesting so we've been doing a lot of training with minecraft and we've been doing it in teams and what what we're doing is participants are playing and through teams we're still having the voice and video chat so any like sort of helper app like that that you're using so like if you use Google Meet or you know if that's what you're using in your district there's no reason why you couldn't have that running in conjunction um, so that's one thing and then it, it's also important for me to mention um, just because it came to me as you said that the um, immersive reader is now built into Minecraft which is fantastic and that um, that you know uh, helps with with accessibility in a, in a great way and also um, I've been seeing people do interesting things with using Immersive Reader to translate their text for things in the game to a different language and then um, posting that in the game so that they can actually accommodate different languages. Plus the Immersive Reader does the read aloud and, and so many other great features. Um, but absolutely, we've been using um, Minecraft Education Edition in conjunction with something to facilitate communication and you can chat by text in the game, which is great. But uh, but yeah, definitely use something like Teams or whatever you'd be using. Kids these days, um, you know, use Discord and they're so used to being in a voice channel in Discord and then playing whatever game it is they're playing. Great, Th thank you for that. We've got a few people who have posted questions about how do I get other teachers excited in my building about using Minecraft? We've That's got some a great naysayers. Question. Yeah, um, so you know that's a, that's such a great question, and that's funny. My uh, my colleague, who I work very closely with, um, finally is really embracing Minecraft um, along with me, and and that took during this COVID period because we've been offering a lot of professional development. Um, it gave her the opportunity to get some you know sort of some hands on training, and I think once you're in there in that environment, you start to get it. Um, I offer a lot of PD in my district. We have something called Staff College, so I'll offer Minecraft Education Edition sessions. Um, but I think when you start showing the projects kids are doing, that helps. And another easy win in terms of point of entry is 
kids, I have a lot of teachers in my building that will come to me and say, I don't use Minecraft, but my but the, this group of students asked if they could do this project in Minecraft. And they'll ask me, is that possible? Can they do it? You know, what would that involve? Um, so using it as an alternate form of assessment is really empowering to kids because again, the rubric, you know, if, if you know, if I want my kids to teach me about um, a national park and they would like to do it by building, you know, in, in Minecraft and having NPCs as tour guides instead of doing a brochure, um, I think that's a great way for a teacher to to be willing to to test the waters and also often be impressed and excited by the result. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks so much, Steve, for sharing your experiences and answering some of those questions. Also on our call today, joining us on the Q&A is Allison Matthews from the Minecraft Education Edition team. She's going to jump on and answer some additional questions that have come up during our call. Allison? This is uh, Allison. I wanted to answer some questions that are in the chat, the live Q&A about licensing. So currently, Minecraft Education Edition is available um, as part of an M365 A3 or A5 bundle. So that's basically a Microsoft bundle um, that many, many, many school districts around the world already own. So it's very likely that you already are licensed. And so you just would need to ask your administrator about that. Um, you can also purchase um, direct licenses for Minecraft Education Edition alone through volume licensing or through a direct channel. So um, we have all kinds of information on that on our website, which is education.minecraft.net. And you can just look for the support channel. We've got a knowledge base with all kinds of knowledge base articles that can answer all the questions that you have. So I've seen questions in the chat also about what are the ages that we've got content for. So of the hundreds of lessons that are available in the library in the game, um, there are lessons from first grade all the way through high school. We actually on the on if you go to YouTube and you search for Minecraft education, you can see the Minecraft education channel and we can probably put this into the chat as well, where we have case study videos that show in classroom footage of lessons being delivered for a first grade class where they're learning about different sources of light. Um, to a middle school class where they're learning about food chain and energy exchange. And then in a eighth grade um, business class for high school credit where they're talking about food trucks and, and creating business plans for food trucks and recreating the food truck in Minecraft. So um, all kinds of options that scale. I also saw a question about math. Um, we have standards aligned math curriculum for third, fourth and fifth grade that we're currently translating into Spanish and Portuguese, um, potentially, I think several other languages as well. Um, and that is available in the game and on our website. Great, thank you so much, Allison. I appreciate you for answering those questions. I'm gonna turn the time over to Steve to tell us about our next steps and what sessions we've got coming uh tomorrow and the rest of the week so um we have a great week um in store and i do hope that people will join um the rest of the webinars tomorrow uh the topic is assessing student learning wednesday it will feature um social emotional learning and the lesson library and thursday is coding with your agent um that's with my lovely wife kathy chow isaacs and friday is getting started with build challenges and i believe each session is being hosted by um, and with in partnership with uh, Minecraft mentors as well as the education team. And, uh, you know, I hope this was a good experience for people and I hope everybody will be back throughout the week. The and this is information you'll be getting, but um, the education.minecraft.net site is somewhere you'll want to go and become a member of. Um, and then there's an achievement code for today's session. If you log into education.microsoft.com, um, and if you see there's a place to sign in um, and use this code, uh, you will get um, an achievement code for participating today. Thank you everybody for joining our first Minecraft Education Edition webinar. Like a special thanks to the Minecraft Education Edition team for hosting, for Allison joining and participating in the Q&A session, Steve for leading our call, and Maria, our global mentor, for sharing her experience. 
Thanks again, and everybody have a fabulous morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are in the world.